This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. Check us out at the link in the description and get involved in our weekly guided practice routines and weekly guided ear training sessions. Hi everybody, Levi Clay here and I'm back again to talk to you about the subject of practice. We've moved into week three of my weekly guided practice routines over on Patreon. If you're interested in joining us, check it out, link in the description. And one of the questions that somebody asked me was, Levi, you've not talked about scales yet. And there's a good reason for that. I am a firm believer, firm believer in the idea that you should never practice scales. I know that sounds really kind of clickbaity, and there's an element of that, I'm not going to lie to you. But at its core, the idea is something that I firmly believe and it's something that I use as part of my teaching all the time. So let's talk a little bit about that. Why do I feel that way? It's probably worth pointing out that if you follow me on Instagram, you will have seen a video where I put up just recently contradicting this idea. I was practicing my scales on the piano. And there's a good reason for that, right? Dexterity, practicing scales, it's good for dexterity, especially on an instrument like the piano where every scale has a different fingering. It's very good to work on that dexterity. But there comes a point where once you've learned that dexterity, once you've got your fingers moving, practicing the scale over and over and over again is not going to help you develop beyond the fact that you can play the scale. Nobody learns the scale and then can just magically play musical ideas, you know, really profound ideas. When I listen to, to great improvisers, and of course I spent a lot of my time in the jazz idiom, uh, when I listen to great impro improvisers in that scene, I don't hear people running up and down scales. And I know that practicing the scale isn't going to get me there. So there's there's obviously something more going on. So what is that? So let's talk about some of the reasons why you should never practice scales. First up, let's talk about the alphabet. So when you think about communication, language, me speaking to you right now, you listening to me, you're hearing what I'm saying, but you're hearing words. You're not hearing letters. Words are made up of letters. That collection of letters could be called the alphabet, right? We practiced the alphabet, we learned the alphabet, but then it comes to the point where you're communicating with people and suddenly that need for understanding the, the component parts of each word disappears. It becomes less about the components of the word and more about the actual words that you're using. Music should be thought of as the same thing. You can practice your scales up and down, just like you can practice your, your alphabet up and down. But is it helping you to say anything? Probably not. As I said earlier, you don't just learn the alphabet and then come out with profound vocabulary. Something I like to say to my students uh, often actually is, you already know the alphabet, you can speak English, cool, speak French. Why can't you just speak French? You know the alphabet, you should be able to speak French. Speak Spanish, you know the alphabet, you should be able to speak Spanish. There's more to different languages than just the, the letters, the, the, the constituents of said language. It's about how those letters come together in order to make vocabulary, in order to make words and sentences. You have to learn about the words. You have to learn the phrases that people use and how they express themselves using the alphabet not just practicing the alphabet. So you should never practice scales because I don't want you to be learning the alphabet. I want you to be learning to express yourself. And this leads on really nicely to the second point, which is when you practice scales, you tend to play scales. And this one really resonates with me. I mean, I grew up a shredder. I mean, actually, if you look behind me, you can see a Vigier Excalibur Ultra there and a uh, an Ormsby Rusty Cooley signature here. I've still got that shred bone in my uh, in my body. I can't get rid of it. But at its core, that's not who I am anymore. When I was a kid, I would practice my scales, my three note per string picking patterns. And it got to the point where when it came to improvisation, it sounded like I was playing scales. You know, Paul Gilbert was my hero. And when you listen to all of those great licks that you hear on things on like the Racer X albums or a great example, actually, uh, from Mr. Big's um, Bump Ahead album, the song Colorado Bulldog, that three note per string pentatonic run at the start of it. That's absolutely a scale, just ascending and descending. And I spent a lot of time learning that when I was a kid, but at its core, it was a scale. And sure, that's fine if that's your goal. 
But as I say, if you practice scales, you'll play scales. The creativity to move from a scale to something incredibly creative, there's something that connects those two things. And I could never work out what that thing was as a teenager. I just figured, well, have faith, practice your scales, and one day I'll be able to sound like the players that I really want to sound like. You know, If I play my scales enough, I'll be able to sound like Mike Stern or Pat Martino. It just wasn't going to happen. You don't become profound. You don't start playing profound things by just playing scales. Now, to be fair, to, to fight the other side on this one, I'm not going to just say to you, you should only play arpeggios because if you practice arpeggios, you will play arpeggios. If you practice any one thing, that's what you're going to play. If you practice arpeggios for a hundred years, you're not suddenly going to have a good idea of, you know, musical vocabulary that you can play over a set of chord changes. You have to study musical vocabulary. Uh, a big part of my weekly guided practice routines, again, link in the description if you want to join us for those, thus far has been working on uh, triads and really being able to understand and visualize triads, the sound of our chords. But obviously we have to move beyond that and we're starting to look at moving beyond those concepts because I don't want your playing to be limited to just the notes of the triad. I don't want your playing to be limited to just the notes of the chord. So the next point that's probably worth talking about, uh, talking about when I talk about being limited to the notes of the chord or being limited to the notes of the scale is the idea of some notes aren't found in the scale in the scale. So a great example might be the minor pentatonic scale versus the blues scale. Many of you, I'm sure, know the minor pentatonic scale. Classic scale consists of five notes, the root, the flat third, the fourth, the fifth, and the flat seventh. The blues scale we think of as being the same scale, but with an added note. It's got that flat five in there. And what we learn from that is that flat five has a sound, and it's something that we like to use as part of our playing. It doesn't strictly belong in the pentatonic scale, so we've given it this kind of new hybrid scale a name to, to kind of fit it into a box, if you like. But at its core, you could really look at that and say, we had a scale, there was a note that I like to play with this scale, but it's not in the scale, so let's give it a name. Well, this idea extends far beyond that. When I go to improvise uh, in a blues context, if I'm playing over a dominant seven chord, you could look at a dominant seven chord and say, okay, the correct pool of notes to play over these uh, over this chord would be the mixolydian mode, the dominant scale. Cool, one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven, awesome. But these notes just aren't enough. There are so many other notes that sound great. The flat third, I play over a, a blues um, progression all the time. Uh, the flat five from the blues scale, I'm going to play that note all of the time. But to be honest, I like to play all of the notes that live around that scale. I'll play the, the flat nine, absolutely. I'll play the, the flat six. I play all of these notes as part of my improvisation because I can phrase with them because I've learned musical phrases rather than learning and practicing scales. To me, when you say mixolydian, I don't think one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven at all. To me, I think one, two, flat three, three, four, flat five, five, six, flat seven, sometimes seven, one. That's a lot of notes there, but it's the way I organize them, the way I can use those notes in order to take a phrase from sounding like this. <laughs> into something that is then going to sound like this. And you can bet your bottom dollar that one of the questions that you always get asked when you play lines like that second idea there is, what scale was that? And it's a tricky one because there isn't an answer. I'm not thinking of a scale. I'm thinking of the sound of the chord. I guess loosely there's the element of mixolydian, but I'm playing so many notes that aren't part of that mixolydian scale, but it's how I use those notes that's important. And you can't just take that scale, take that idea, take that pool of notes and practice it up and down, up and down, and suddenly be able to play musically profound things. You have to work on musical ideas in order to break yourself out of those scalar sounding ideas. So what might some of those ideas be? Well, one of the things that we're going to start looking at in weekly guided practice routines now is sequences. So before even dealing with scales, we're going to talk about sequences. 
sequences would be the idea of taking a scale and rather than just playing it ascending and descending, immediately breaking that thing up. You might take uh, a C mixolydian scale and rather than just playing it up and down like this, You might mix that up by playing it in ascending groups of four. So play the first four notes, then go to the second note and ascend up four notes, third note, ascend up four notes. It's the most basic form of sequence, but it's infinitely more musical than just playing the scale. That sounds like this. Another sequence that you might like to practice is taking diatonic thirds found within the scale. Play the first note, play the third note, play the second note, then the fourth note, the third note, then the fifth note, so on and so forth. This is a great way of breaking up that the sound of that scale into something that sounds a little bit more musical. In fact, if you start mixing the directions, maybe you ascend some thirds, but then descend some thirds, you really start to take something that was at its core a scale, but you've turned it into something that sounds a lot more musical by breaking that scale up. At its core, I guess you are still kind of practicing the scale, but you're you're changing the way that you practice the scale. If you practice a scale like this, then ideas like this are going to come out in your playing. And sure, these are scalar ideas, but you've dressed them up in a way that makes them sound infinitely more musical. Check it. Now the final reason I would talk about practicing anything other than scales is that we unfortunately are not long for this world, right? We have a limited amount of time to experience our lives and there's a limited amount of time that we can devote to practice. There's a limited amount of time that we can devote to getting better on our instrument. And the reality of the situation is you cannot learn everything. You cannot practice everything. You cannot be a master of absolutely everything. So you need to be very careful with how you're spending your time, where you are spending your time, right? I would happily argue that you could, as part of a practice routine, include running through scales in 12 keys, okay? You absolutely could put in that, put that in there. It's going to be relatively good for your dexterity, but it's not going to help your overall, overall musicality. So I would say rather than putting that 10 minutes of scale practice in your practice routine, would that time be better spent working on developing your ear, being able to hear a chord, like for example this, and then over the top of that being able to hear different sounds. So being able to hear something like a mixolydian sound, which would sound like this. Or then being able to hear what it would sound like to hear something like Lydian dominant, which is a different sound. When you hear this on a record, you want to be able to identify it, and that would sound like this. So working on different elements of your playing and making sure that you're maximizing your practice time is something that is very near and dear to my heart, right? I think that, uh, and I mentioned this last week when I talked about the Holy Trinity of practice, I think it's so easy for us to get caught up in the fingers rather than developing the mind and being able to develop the ear. Uh, I talked about developing the ear last time and I, I have mentioned weekly guided practice routines, which I'm doing every week for, for Patreon guys. I've also started doing weekly guided ear training sessions because it feels silly like a, a, a practice routine routine is very much going to be about the mind and the fingers but you have to be developing that ear as well and I, I just think that why fill our time with practicing up and down scales which you know let's be realistic here guys you know you've you've been there you've done it you're probably uh, you've been in that situation where you're banging your head against the wall and you're unable to work out why you can't push to that next level 
And this is it. Your ear isn't as developed as it needs to be. Your mind isn't as developed as it needs to be. You're just running the fingers up and down scales and you're not engaging the heart. You're not engaging the mind. You're not engaging the ear. All the things that you that you love about music, the reason you picked up an instrument in the first place, none of those things are there anymore. You're just doing the physical. So I think scales are a massive, massive distraction. And once you've learned them, you should not be needing to practice them. Move on. Start working on things that are going to take your music to the next level. Start working on things that are going to make you sound like a musician rather than a technician. I just want to say a huge thank you to all of my wonderful supporters over on Patreon and an extra special thanks to Chris Locke, your awesome top tier patron. Thanks very much, bud. I really appreciate it. If you want to be like these awesome people and join us for weekly guided practice routines and weekly guided ear training sessions, check out the link in the description. And if that doesn't suit, you can always check me out on Amazon, check out one of my books. I definitely have a fair few available and I'm sure you will find something in there that you enjoy. And if you don't, well, I apologize for that unreservedly. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. If you have thoughts, you want to fight with me about it, let me know in that comment section below. I'm always reading, happy to get back to you. I couldn't do what I do without your love and support. So, and commenting and subscribing and telling your friends about stuff is absolutely a way that that happens. So thank you very much. Get on with some practice and I'll see you for another video soon. Laters.